All right, let's go Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, though it will, I'll confess now, it'll take us a little longer than normal to actually get to our text this morning. Uh, there's a hefty bit of setup work that I got to do, so I apologize in advance for that. But if you're still learning where things are in the Bible, you've got lots of runway today. All right, so, um, so Matthew chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, uh, we'll have the text up on the screens behind me in just a little bit. We also have some physical Bibles scattered around the room, little racks beneath the seats. If you don't own a Bible, we would invite you to take that physical one home. There's lots of good reasons for that, but I'm in a hurry. So um, welcome to week number 10, by my count. Uh, week number 10 of our effort to walk through the book of Matthew to, uh, together. Uh, if you're a visitor here, you're new to things, maybe even you're, you've got no experience with the Bible itself, never fear, I've got you covered. Uh, here's what you need to know about Matthew. Matthew is what's called a gospel account, which means that it tells the story of Jesus's life and work. And by life and work, I mean his origin, his public ministry, and so his teaching, his miracles, signs and wonders, those things. But then also the gospels all tell us about his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. That's what the gospels are. And there's four of them. And all four gospels do the exact same thing. They tell the singular story of Jesus. But each of those four gospels do, does it in a unique way for their specific audience. And so what makes Matthew unique is that he structures his reporting of the story of Jesus by intentionally focusing on Jesus, uh, Jesus's role as the long awaited messianic king of the Jews. All right. Um, Messianic king of the Jews. Matthew's writing to a predominantly Jewish audience. And so uh, they come preloaded with Jewish history. They come preloaded with Jewish covenant understanding, with expectations and presuppositions. And so Matthew spends considerable effort, way more than the other three gospel writers, showing that Jesus uh, was no mere phenomena that just kind of stepped onto the scene one day out of nowhere, but rather that he is the fulfillment of every single promise God ever made to Israel. Right, that's what Matthew's going out of his way to show off. That all of the things that God was building towards to reconcile the world to himself after the fall find their fulfillment in Jesus. And so a line that's quoted over and over again in the book of Matthew, one that we ought to be familiar with by now, but we definitely will be familiar with by the time we get all the way through this thing, is this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Over and over again, that's Matthew's line. All right? And just like taking a quick glance, there's... there's there's Old Testament quotations all over this thing, all right? It's everywhere you turn in the book of Matthew. Uh, but, and if it's not a direct quote, Matthew seems to intentionally drop a bunch of Old Testament phrasing uh, all throughout this, uh, this book. And he kind of assumes that his highly biblically literate audience are going to pick up on that phrasing and do something with it. Understand some depth of meaning that's just not there on the surface, right? But we can go even further than that because on top of those things, as Matthew spells out the more biographical portions of Jesus' story, he does so in a way that seems to show that Jesus is re-experiencing Israel's own history. And that re-experience, it comes with a lot of contrast because while Jesus walks through each of those moments victoriously, that's, that's a decidedly different tone than how Israel normally handled things, which uh, their typical pattern, which last I checked, was better described as a giant dumpster fire. Like, they, they failed over and over and over and over again. And so to read the Old Testament correctly, like there's lots of bad ways to read it, but to read the Old Testament correctly is to understand that God loved Israel in spite of Israel, not because of Israel. Deuteronomy 9.6, Know therefore that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness. For you are a stubborn people, he says. Verse 7, remember and do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day you came out of the land of Egypt until the day you came to this place, you have, been a rebellion, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Even at Horeb, you provoked the God to wrath, and the Lord was so angry with you that he was ready to destroy you. And so Jesus doesn't merely step onto the scene as one claiming to be Israel's rightful king. No, he steps onto the scene faithfully living out what Israel and her, and her kings could never, ever, 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 ever come anywhere close to doing for themselves. They didn't have it in the tank to live righteously before the Lord. So Jesus comes and lives righteously for them. And in his righteous and kingly ascension, Jesus begins to gather a people to himself. And he begins to teach with authority, calling everyone to repentance. And he begins to make bold and, and incredibly public claims about him being this long-awaited Messiah figure. But uh, at which point, like, it puts a giant target on his back. Like, there, it causes a lot of people around him to bristle, to actually reject Jesus. But Jesus also, in that moment, begins performing a bunch of signs and wonders that show that there's far more going on here than just some dude stepping onto the scene with some lofty aspirations. 
Those miracles put an immediate check on everybody around him that would seek to just make Jesus go away. They can't do it. They can't do anything about it. And so the crowd begins to grow and things begin to swell. And while there's a pretty good show going on, a lot of folks in that crowd are not really sure what to do with Jesus. They don't know how to categorize him. And Jesus begins to gather disciples, formal disciples, to obediently sit under his, the yoke of his teaching. And then last week, last week we saw Jesus begin making the intentional act to formalize his teaching. Matthew makes a, a point in his gospel account of letting the king go ahead and speak for himself. And so his account is organized around five kind of long-form teachings of Jesus. We call them the five discourses. And the first one, the one we started looking at last Sunday, is by far the most famous of those discourses. It's called the Sermon on the Mount, because get this, Jesus goes up on a mountain and he preaches a sermon. (laughs) Most creative people ever, right? There are a couple of reasons, at least by my count, there are a couple of reasons why the Sermon on the Mount is the most famous of the five discourses. Uh, For one, uh, it is rightly seen as the King's Manifesto. Rightly seen as such. Uh, If you want to truly understand what Jesus values, if you want to truly understand what he expects of his followers, then you better be looking at the Sermon on the Mount. It's not the only place you should look. You should obviously look other places, but it should probably be the first place you look. Jesus tells us himself how he wants his kingdom to operate. Jesus tells us us himself uh, what the ethics and the values of his kingdom citizens ought to be. And so to try to to make sense of Jesus uh, without the Sermon on the Mount is foolish, and your assessment will be wrong. You need this. And so the Sermon on the Mount is famous for its obvious importance, but it's not all it's famous for. The second reason is because Jesus says a lot of stuff here that a lot of people really, really like, even non-Christians. Stuff about not judging others, about giving to the needy, Stuff about trusting the Father to provide instead of being anxious. Some of the most famous and celebrated stuff that Jesus said, it's all in the Sermon on the Mount. But there's also some stuff that many people, because let's just be honest, they've never actually read it for themselves. There's also a lot of stuff in this sermon that many people would be surprised to learn that Jesus said. Stuff that reframes cultural debates and kind of sort of paints both sides of that debate as both of them getting it wrong. Stuff that intentionally challenges the desires and the idols a lot of people cling to and would fly to protect. Stuff that some people very much wish Jesus had left unsaid. You know, it's true and all, but why do you have to bring it up now? Jesus never said anything like that, right? See, in the next several weeks, We're going to get into some of that stuff. And if you're paying attention at all, um, it will be a struggle for some people. (laughs) If you're looking for the ethics of the king and his kingdom to line up with what you already value and pursue, you're going to walk away pretty frustrated with Jesus. You just will. You might, I don't know, maybe, you might even reject him the same way that some first century Galileans ultimately did. Don't know how to categorize him. And walk away. Because listen, the king isn't looking for feedback. He's dictating his terms. He's clarifying how things actually work in his kingdom. And we saw the first little bit of that last week. The Sermon on the Mount opens up with Jesus teaching what we have come to call the Beatitudes. Statements of blessedness, right? How happy are you? How fortunate are you to be blank, right? Uh, But looking at the list of all the blanks, uh, none of the eight things that Jesus mentions uh, as Beatitudes are things that I would naturally want for myself. I I, I don't want any of those things, let let alone most of those things. Uh, I, I certainly wouldn't consider myself blessed to have experienced them. And so the question that we had to answer last week was if Jesus was a lunatic or if Jesus is, you know, the only guy in the room who actually knows what's going on. He's the only one that actually understands ultimate realities and he understands them better than you and I do because the upside downness of, of his kingdom ethics is clear. All you have to do is read, right? If you don't see the difference between Jesus' kingdom and the kingdoms of this world, then you probably need to work on your reading comprehension skills. It's there. So the question is not, is it different? The question is, is it better? 
Is it better? Upside down and awkward for us, of course, but is it better? And last week, last week we closed out our time by looking at the most obviously upside down of the, of the Beatitudes. Jesus says, blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake. See, the simple and frustratingly unavoidable reality is that walking in the righteousness that God calls us to walk in, walking in righteousness before the Lord, it will almost certainly result in some form of persecution for God's people. And the reason for that is because the sin-broken world that we're living in, it doesn't handle otherworldly ethics so great. It reacts to them with ridicule and with rage. And so persecution will come for God's people. Anybody telling you otherwise is grossly out of step with Jesus. So, so what do we do then with this whole blessed are those things? Like how do we categorize that? Well, Jesus doesn't say you're fortunate to be persecuted for the sake of righteousness and just leave it there. He says, how fortunate are you because yours is the kingdom of heaven, right? Meaning they may take your stuff, they may take your opportunities, they may even take your life, but they can never lay their hands on what Jesus would have you see as a preeminent value. The kingdom is an eternally secure reward. And so yes, even in the face of persecution, Jesus would argue that you are incorruptibly fortunate because that persecution can only ever attack and affect temporary treasures. So Jesus says that you're blessed. Okay, but like what now? <laughs> like what, what do we do with that? Well, we didn't address it last week, but uh, there is a logical question that flows out of that reality. Maybe you caught it. Maybe you put the pieces together last week. I didn't talk about it, but... It's there. There's a logical next question to, the, uh, to that. And so if, if pushback and persecution are natural results of living righteously in a fallen world, and you're not experiencing some form of pushback and persecution, some level of that, why not? Like, What do you, what do, you do with that question? Well, it's possible, I think it's genuinely possible that you're surrounded only by those that hold the same upside down values that you do. And maybe you live in a lovely little, you know, spiritual echo chamber and you, uh, those around you are, all love Jesus too. And they've committed their lives to pursuing the exact same things that you've committed your life to pursuing. And in that good God-given community, you're encouraged and you're supported and you flourish. And truthfully, I think that's what the church is supposed to be. I think that's what it's designed to be for people. An otherworldly community where all of those things happen for God's people people. But none of us, including the guy who goes to work every day at a church building, none of us are only surrounded by those who are officially on Team Jesus. And so we, we probably, I don't know, maybe need another reason why pushback and persecution don't happen in our lives. And so I think it's also possible that those around you don't see enough about your life to even know that you view the world in a fundamentally different way than they do. Am I wrong about that? <laughs> For various and sundry reasons. Maybe it's just an opportunity issue, or maybe it's a sinful fear of man issue. I don't, I don't know. But for whatever reason, you've been flying under the radar, and you haven't actually given people a reason to think otherwise. And if you're new around here, Ask any long-timer in the room. We spent an ample amount of time uh, making sure people understand that being jerks for Jesus does not help you with your evangelism. Um, it always makes evangelism harder, so shut that down. But truthfully, like just do the math real quick. Uh, all of your relationships can be boiled down into just two categories. Relationships that are only surface level because of either proximity or the facade that you've put up. Or two, relationships where people know the real you right? That's really all you got. And honestly, while some of your relationships rightly and appropriately exist in category one, there are some other relationships that will never move past category one and into category two because it's costly for you to take that step. It doesn't come for free. It's risky. You're not sure how people will respond to that and you'd really rather not deal with it, you know? Or am I the only guy that does that? And again, Jesus is either a lunatic or he's the only guy in the room who understands how ultimate realities work. 
His ethics are upside down. Nobody doubts that, but are they better? But listen, while those are two genuine options for a lack of persecution and pushback, there is a third. And it comes from a decidedly different angle. And it's also what we are finally going to look at this morning in the text. So join me in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is going to continue spelling out the realities of his kingdom in verse 13. He says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. All right, so we'll call time out there. The, the longer you've spent in church, uh, the more sermons and Bible studies you've sat under uh, where you know, people try to get cute and put a creative spin on whatever this idea of salt is, right? All right uh, and, and that spin typically typically involves trying to pin down exactly what salt supposedly is and does in the culture of Jesus's original audience. Uh, and You'd think that that would be a straightforward thing, but it's not a straightforward thing because there are lots and lots and lots of options available to us to pick. Uh, And so sometimes, sometimes pastors uh, will stand up and they'll plant their flag in in, uh, one or maybe even two of those options with the kind of assertion that all of the other options are obviously wrong and you're a dummy for thinking them, right? Um, I would never do that. All right, that that was a better joke than that. All right, come on. All right, so... Like, like, sometimes they're just that assertive. And, and like, here's the, it definitely means, and all the other people are being uh, ridiculous. Uh, and so we've, we've got we've to deal with all the options today, or at least some of the options, the best options. So, and so what are the possible options for whatever salt is in first century Galilean, Greco-Roman society? Um, well, the most obvious one to us in our modern culture uh, would be to see salt as something that seasons stuff, right? Like, we, we're surrounded by salt every day. It sits on most of the tables we eat at, or at least it's in the pantry. Salt is already in most of the food that we consume, so much so that if you've ever had a doctor put you on a low-sodium diet, you struggle to find things that you're actually allowed to eat, right? It's just everywhere. The world is quite aware of how salt makes things taste better, and that wouldn't have been a foreign idea to the world that Jesus is speaking into right here. The first century Greco-Roman world would have naturally understood that purpose for salt. In fact, that, that purpose is actually used in the Bible as an illustration. In Colossians 4, 6, Paul tells us, or he uses salt as an illustration for carefully nuanced speech. He says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. And so the theory goes, the theory goes that Christians are to have a positive seasoning effect on the culture around them, the world around them. They are to make the world a better and more enjoyable place by bringing good and needed flavor to the world. And that sounds like a winning sermon right there, right? Man, I can, I can get all kinds of like ramped up on that one. I think Christians should add a unique flavor to the world. Absolutely. Another option, popular option that people try to offer up is that in ancient times, salt held a significantly uh, more valuable thing as, as a preservative. Um, in a world where a refrigerator hadn't been invented yet, you really only had a few options to, to handle your uneaten meat. You smoke it, you salt it, or you lose it, right? The decision to slaughter an animal had to be timed. It had to be planned out carefully. And copious amounts of salt gave them a tool to stretch out and a very important investment. It extended the payout of something that was costly to them to produce. It protected it from rot and from ruin, right? And so the theory goes that Jesus intends Christians to have a preserving effect upon society. Disciples are to keep the world from certain ruin by being agents of righteousness that draw out that which would otherwise spoil. And historically, historically, a whole bunch of preachers and commentators land exactly there. Like That's the one that people are like, no, everybody else is an idiot on. And for good reason. Salt was far from a rare thing in Israel. Far from a rare thing. It's incredibly prevalent, in fact, in that part of the world. And you already know that to be true because nobody can go to a mall these days and avoid, like, trying to avoid contact with, like, the people in the kiosk trying to sell you skincare products from the Dead Sea, right? It's everywhere. All they've got to do is scrape that mud up and put it in a jar. But listen, while seasoning and preservation are the most prominent of the, of the theories, there are definitely others. Um, some have argued 
Some have argued that Jesus is pointing to salt as a, a part of the sacrificial system. And they've, they've got a good argument because the Leviticus 2.13 tells Israel to sprinkle their sacrifices with salt before they offer them. Because of salt's value, but also because it was an intentional step to protect them from rote sacrifice. It was an action to make it the sacrifice better. Others have argued that salt can be used as a fertilizer. If your ground is lacking certain minerals, adding a little bit of salt can help things grow. But that kind of leans into the making things better category, right? But you can't add too much salt because salting the earth is precisely how you would prevent things from growing from a long, for a long time. Like if you were an invading army and you wanted to make sure that you actually wiped them out, you salt the earth, right? And so some argue that Jesus is referring to his people as some kind of judgment upon the earth. That their presence offers a comparative righteousness that is clearly fallen short of by those outside of the kingdom. So which is it? Like, which, which theory about salt is the correct one? Because I didn't even share the weird ones. Those are just the popular ones. Which one should we go with? And the answer is, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Jesus hasn't told us what he means. I could try to plant my flag in my preferred theory, but honestly, it's just speculation. And so a lot of faithful preachers and commentators have been very, very careful to suggest that perhaps, maybe, Jesus really does mean several of those options all at once. That his people are supposed to have a number of positive effects upon the world around them. But all of that talk about salt and what it is and what it did, it kind of misses the point of what Jesus actually said. Because Jesus doesn't simply stop at calling his followers salt. He adds a question to it, right? If salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? The Greek there for losing taste... It's more, it has way more going on than just something being tasty. All right? It has the idea of proving something to be empty and foolish. To turn around and make a mockery of something because that something no longer has any sense to it. Jesus seems to be talking about something no longer being useful because everything that made that thing useful is now gone. So whatever that nice sounding theoretical purpose that we decided to attach to metaphorical salt, whichever, pick your poison, go with whichever one you want. Jesus then wonders out loud, hey, what do you do with that salt when it can no longer accomplish that thing? That's the question he asks. What do you, what do, you do with salt when it's no longer salty? You know, when it's just a weird rock after that. He says you turn it into gravel. You trample upon it. That's the only thing it's good for after that. Church, this is a scary thought. I don't know if, you, if you've caught up to speed yet on how scary a thought it is. Because Jesus seems to be saying here that when people who claim to be his followers are not actually distinct from the world, he's got no real purpose for them. What does he need them for? For all of the ink that's been spilled over this text and for all the sermons that have been preached with flag-planted theories about you know, how, what salty Christians are supposed to, to look like, Jesus' question flies past every bit of that and he makes it clear that there's no middle ground with him. You're either, you're either part of his kingdom or you're kind of in the way. Followers of Jesus are to be who Jesus expects them to be. And so the obvious next question is, well, who and what does King Jesus expect us to be? And well, Jesus answers that question in verse 14. Look at it. He says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Verse 15, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. All right, so Jesus mixes his metaphors here. I'm not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to do that, but Jesus gets to do what he wants, all right? All right? Jesus mixes his metaphors. He calls his followers the light of the world, an unhideable city on top of a hill. So what's all that about? Well, just like salt, light's got a bunch of really awesome, good, noble purposes too, right? A light in the dark it does more than just help you see what you want to see. It can, light can provide safety, right? That's the whole reason that security lights are a thing. Light is a, or is a requisite for work and for play and for community whenever the sun goes down. So it's a platform for that other good and necessary things are, are, are made possible upon and are dependent upon. But listen, light also provides hope. You ever been in a darkness that you can't control? A light suddenly showing up, that affects far more than just your sense of sight, doesn't it? The, the, the whole reason why a light at the end of the tunnel is a statement, it's not a pragmatic statement. That's an, a deeply emotional statement. 
The distinctiveness between light and darkness is, is a much bigger divide than just salty or not salty, isn't it? Followers of Jesus stand out in the world not only as, a, as different, but gloriously different. But in this moment, Jesus he doesn't ask what happens when light loses its lightiness. Light is distinct from the darkness or it's not light at all. Now this time, Jesus makes some statements about how ridiculous it is to try and hide light. He says that a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. We live in a world where we're blessed to see things like satellite maps of city lights and at night. I'm, I'm, I'm the geek that definitely just like pours over those things and spends way too long out of my week like looking at that kind of stuff. I, I may have spent an hour or two this week when I thought about that, like, like not doing what I was supposed to do because I, I, got, I went down the Google hole, all right? So we also live in a, in a world where our roadways are lit up city after city after city after city, so much so that some people get mad about how much light there is. But that's not how the world worked for Jesus' original audience, was it? The wilderness between cities was dark. It was dangerous. If you're traveling and you end up being delayed, not getting where you want to go before the sun went down, you're not flicking on your headlights and then continuing on barreling down the road. That's not how that works. What you do in that moment is you either set up camp in the safest place that you can find in that moment, or you're double time in it, trying to get yourself in a hurry to the next inhabited place. You don't hang out on the dark road. Can you imagine what it would be like hurrying along, you're a little anxious, probably a little frustrated at yourself that you went down the Google hole, <laughs> probably overthinking every stray sound on the side of the road, and you get... You top the hill, and on the next hill over, you see a bright and shining city. What kind of relief would that provide for you? Church, Jesus begins to insinuate here. Begins to insinuate something here that looks a little different than certain persecution and a response as a response for righteousness. He begins to insinuate something here that's a little different than a critical question about the usefulness of unsalty salt. He begins to paint a picture that on the other side of ridicule and on the other side of rage, the distinctiveness of his people might also maybe sometimes be seen as attractive. As a wonderful relief to those desperately longing for a light to finally shine. That many who might initially kick against the distinctiveness sometimes actually come to love it and embrace it. And that lots of lights making up a community of light becomes something that actually is incredibly beautiful and inviting. And this is one of the things on the list for why God has given us the local church. See, in all of our saltiness, and all of our otherworldliness, Jesus uses the upside-down distinctions of his kingdom citizens to draw new followers to himself. And so, if you're new around here, let me say out loud something you may have never heard from a church leader before. We have no plans at all to try to impress you. None. That's not what we do here. As if I could. I don't have that in me. But even if I did, man, it's our awkward charm that we see as our greatest weapon against your defenses. Good luck. Because if you, you stick around long enough, we'll eventually wear you down. You'll come to like us. Some of you are here because of that. Don't act like it's not true. But listen, is there anything at all that can actually stand in the way of the attractiveness of the light? Yeah, there is. Yeah, the answer is us trying to hide it. And so Jesus points out how ridiculous that idea is in verse 15. Look at it. Nor do people light a lamp uh, and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. So I've been in situations, maybe you're, you haven't, but I certainly have. I've been in situations where people have attempted to teach this text, and they focused their attention on trying to highlight that Christians are sometimes guilty of being shy. Sometimes guilty of being a little timid. Uh, and, and so the message that that leads to is one that says that Christians should, you know, instead be brave to show off the light, right? And in a sense, that, that is true. In fact, I, I think that it's 
that's an important thing to point out and, and maybe even critique when, when that does come up in the church. But I also think that that angle ignores how such a statement would have sounded to Jesus' original audience. Right? Um, they would have heard uh, the idea of placing a, a lamp under a basket as an incredibly foolish thing. And I mean foolish in the old-fashioned technical sense of the term. Uh, so take a second, just like as call time out here, take a second and try to count light bulbs in this room right now. I like just 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 give it a give it a once over. Try to do the math real fast. Hey, you know what led to the widespread adoption of electric lighting? It wasn't the invention of electric lighting. Uh, arc lamps were invented about a hundred years before Edison's patented light bulb. All right, so they were around. In fact, the city of Cleveland, Ohio, was the first city in the U.S. to have uh, electric street lights, and that happened the year before Edison patented his light bulb. So whole city lit up before Edison's light bulb was invented. So what did Edison's bulb actually do? It made electric light cheap to produce. The bulbs were easier to make. They were significantly more energy efficient than what came before them. You done counting bulbs yet? What you got? The answer is 85. In this room, 85, just in this room. And that's not counting emergency lights. That's an extra 10. It's also not counting the, the light bar thing behind the cross. There's about 400 little tiny LED bulbs in there. We're so used to, in our culture, flipping on a switch to get cheap and reliable light, right? We live in such a technologically advanced age that turning on a flashlight in a tight space, or worse, turning on the flashlight on our stinking watch we have never, ever, ever, ever had to think of conservation in our light decision making. Have we? Jesus is, because of this, I think, I think our cultures are so distinct that Jesus' question here, statement here, it completely misses us. He's speaking to an audience that had to fill a lamp with incredibly costly oil and you don't waste that stuff. And when you've made the decision to go ahead and spend the effort and spend the expense to light your lamp, you're doing everything in your power to try to maximize that tiny little light source so that the whole house can benefit from it, right? The old-fashioned definition for foolish means something is incredibly wasteful. Incredibly wasteful. It would have been foolish to light a lamp and then stick it under something so you can't see. You're almost literally burning your money away. So what do they do instead? They... They did the opposite of hiding it. They put it up on a big pole, a lampstand, so they could provide light to the whole house, right? And so what is Jesus saying then? He's saying that a hiding of the distinct but attractive light of the gospel is not merely an issue of shyness. It's an issue of foolishness. It's incredibly wasteful. That which had been given for a glorious purpose is instead being misused, being mishandled, and so what's the alternative? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 16. It says, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. It says, let your light shine, man. Woo! This might come as a shock to you, um, but this is yet another part of the Sermon on the Mount that gets twisted into weird stuff. Um, if you were to strip verse 16 of, you know, completely out of its context, which I've totally never seen anybody try to do, but let's say hypothetically that they did, all right, uh, you could make verse 16 say that Jesus is giving you a mandate to take all the things that you love and are passionate about and then put them on display for a watching world to see and celebrate. And how dare, how dare anybody stand in the way of what Jesus told you to go make a personal light shining effort about? But up to this point, up to this point, the light that Jesus has been talking about is an otherworldly righteousness that does not exist in you, does not originate in you, is gifted to you by an otherworldly Savior and King. The distinctiveness that, that makes it attractive is precisely because it doesn't originate you in, in, in you and in this world. So taking this verse out of context robs you of the very thing that this, about this verse that makes it special. But while a wrong origination point is a big deal and it's a problem, it's actually not the biggest problem with people decontextualizing verse 16. The bigger problem is what it results in. To see this as a personal mandate to show yourself off, it puts the attention and the celebration on you, doesn't it? 
But Jesus gave a far, far loftier purpose to shining your light before others. What does he say? He says, so that. Meaning that there is a much more valuable end to your light shining means. So that you may see, they may see your good works and give glory to who? Your Father who is in heaven. The end goal of otherworldly light shining is attention on and celebration of the Father, not you. Jesus says that, that when you stand as distinct from the world, the world is going to notice. It can't not notice. And sometimes, according to verse 10, the world will respond with ridicule and with rage. And sometimes, according to verse 16, some in the world will respond with celebration and submission to the king. They'll come to love him through your distinctiveness. And the frustrating truth is that you and, I, that you and I, we have pretty much zero control at all of whether we're going to be on the receiving end of response number one or response number two. We can't control that. But salt is supposed to be salty. And light cannot help but make a scene in a dark world. And so whether we're talking about Christians individually or we're talking about Christians gathered together in a local body called a church, when God's people are humbled by God's holiness, and in spiritual poverty, we are repentant of our sin. When, when we are shaped by a meekness that desires to be used for God and his good purposes. And when we have a holy ambition to go chasing deeply after personal righteousness. And when we give and we receive and we give mercy. And when we stand as self-sacrificing peacemakers in a world that has zero framework for peacemaking. Yeah, yeah, we're going to look different. We can't not look different. We're going to stick out like a sore thumb. So persecution is kind of an obvious and natural result of that. Whether major or minor, ridicule or rage, we ought to expect that the world will typically respond in precisely that way. Yeah, it's coming. Our Savior and King has promised such things. But for some, for some, they will see the otherworldly distinction of God's people and they'll get a taste of an alien saltiness. And they'll catch a glimpse of a light where they thought no light would ever, ever come. And they will want it for themselves. It'll be strangely attractive to them and it will be what God uses to bring them slowly to himself. And in doing so, he will continue to build his good kingdom and we will forever get to celebrate his goodness. So what do we do with this stuff, huh? How, how can we respond to God's word this morning? Well, for those of us who are followers of Jesus, the obvious response is to do what King Jesus said to do. Let your light shine before others. It's really not that complicated. Those relationships that have moved past the surface level stuff, or maybe the ones you're hoping to move past the surface level stuff, do, do they know what drives you? Do they know what... You know what you claim to orbit your life around? Or has salt lost its taste? It's risky. I, I get that. Um, you're really not sure how they're going to respond, and maybe you'd rather avoid it altogether. But again, Jesus is either a lunatic, or he's the only guy around who knows how ultimate realities work. His kingdom is upside down. Nobody doubts that, but is it better? Because the king's not taking feedback, he's, he's dictating terms, he's clarifying how his, how his kingdom actually works. I'm personally convinced that he can be trusted, though. How about you? I'm convinced that the king is eternally good. But what about those of you who are not followers of Jesus yet? How, how can you respond? The answer's simple, by meeting Jesus. Hey, you know what's worse than taking hits for an otherworldly king in his kingdom? Taking those hits for a king and kingdom that you don't belong to? That seems foolish. Um, there's no purpose at all in submitting yourself to the upside-down realities of Jesus' kingdom if you're on the outside looking in. That, that's just a waste of everything. Go get you some fun stuff. But maybe, I don't know, maybe you got a little salt on your tongue lately and you're starting to think that you like it. Maybe you've been living your whole life in the dark and that city on the hill is starting to look pretty inviting. How do you get there? Well, the Bible teaches that all people are separated relationally from God because of our sin, that we are owed the just and right punishment for that sin. The Bible calls that punishment God's wrath. 
But the Bible also teaches that God is rich in mercy and that he loves us with an incredibly great love that even when we are dead in our trespasses and sins, he makes us alive through the grace of Christ. God God the Father sent God the Son. He put on flesh and he dwelt among us. He lived the sinless life that you and I are not able to live. He died on the cross as an innocent substitute to make full and final payment for your sin. And he was raised again from the dead as a vindication of his own perfect and sufficient righteousness. And so now as the king who conquered sin and death, he calls on you to respond to him, to actually come into his kingdom. He says, come to me. And you do that by by repenting of your sin and turning to him as Savior and Lord. Man, I'd love to help you do that today. Let's go. Let's talk about it. I'd love to be helpful to you. Or maybe you're here today and you need to respond in some other kind of way. Maybe that's time to step forward formally and join our church family. Add your awkwardness to the pile. It'll be fun. Or maybe it's time to be obedient to Jesus and his command to be baptized. For whatever reason, you haven't done what the king said to do yet. We've got to fix that. Let's fix that. Or maybe it's time to publicly say yes to his call that he's placed upon you to take the gospel somewhere far away from here. I, we want to help you figure out how to get there. But that's a good week for me. But whoever you are, and however God's word is calling you to respond this morning, let's all respond together right now. Father, you're good to us. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for the book of Matthew. Thank you for your upside down, salty kingdom. God, for those of us on the inside, would you, uh, would you call us to be the kind of light that can't be missed? It can't help but be seen. And maybe, maybe that comes with ridicule and rage. But maybe it comes with new people coming to know you. Father, for those in here who don't know you yet, would you make yourself known even right now? Would you make us a city on a hill that they flock to? Not for our glory, but for yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.